Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. I'm actually very humbled to be here. Um, one of the things I've discovered in talking to so many of you at, um, at lunch and throughout the day, and yes, I'm the woman who is wandering the halls with a baby. That's me. Um, <laughs> but um, one of the things I've discovered is that so many people here have amazing stories. Amazing stories. And it's humbling to me. I'm a cradle Catholic. I'm coming from a completely different perspective. And I was privileged to grow up in a home where my father, now my father taught law for many years at the University of Notre Dame, and he was a natural law scholar. So growing up, I had the opportunity to be immersed in the tradition of natural law theology and philosophy from an early age, and it became as natural to me as breathing. So when I was older and I went to college, went to Notre Dame, and um, afterwards just being out in the world, I'm always struck by what a different, different culture it is almost if, if you're not steeped in that kind of tradition. So I count my, I consider myself very, very blessed, but I'm humbled by so many of the stories I've heard um, that I've heard today. And with that as sort of the background, I should mention too that when I first started doing research for um, my talk today, and I promise I won't make it too academic. I am an academic though, so I could talk forever, just as a word of warning. <laughs> but I know there's a clock, so that will keep me, that'll keep me in the boundaries. But one of the, one of the things that was um, a little challenging for me was that when I think about St. Thomas Aquinas, and I think about tradition, my natural reaction is, of course, what is there to talk about? Thomas is so firmly rooted in tradition, and he, he uses tradition effortlessly as he's proving this theory or, or proving this point or that point and, um, and weaves it together in such a wonderful way. In fact, so many Thomists have described Thomas as a genius, not because of any originality, striking originality in his thought. His genius is that he has taken the wisdom of centuries and put it together in an amazingly, breathtakingly systematic way. And that's the genius of St. Thomas Aquinas. So that was my initial reaction, the, well, what am I going to talk about for 45 minutes? I could either read you the entire Summa, which would, I would enjoy it, I, but it would be long. <laughs> or there's really not that much to say because of course he's rooted in tradition. Well, okay, thank goodness for the internet. I went online and I just Googled Aquinas sacred scripture and tradition and pulled up an argument by um, several people uh, arguing that St. Thomas Aquinas is somehow in favor of sola scriptura. And, and that was my reaction. I was a little bit taken aback. But looking at it, it's, this is probably a good thing for me to review with all of you, um, given, just given the fact that this argument is out there. Because once something is out there on the internet, it acquires legs, right? So anyone who, if I could find this Googling, I'm, I had to get my kids to download the PowerPoint on a flash drive. If I could find this on the internet, anybody can. So what I, here's what I'd like to do today, okay? And I, again, I, I know it's late in the afternoon. I had the, I had the privilege of teaching undergraduates at eight o'clock in the morning with a philosophy class. So if you all start to nod off, I'm gonna have you stand up and do jumping jacks or something like that. <laughs> But one of, the, um, one of the things I'd like to do is just quickly run through some of the relevant texts, okay? Just to make it very, very clear that any reading of St. Thomas that purports to see him as someone who would advocate an approach using sola scriptura is completely unfounded, okay? We're gonna go through that. Um, then what I would like to do is just look at what St. Thomas says about authority, because it seems to me the whole question of tradition really takes us back to um, your understanding of authority. Who has authority? How do we understand it? How do we use it? And where does that take us? And then just thinking about our culture, one of the things that I see going on with our culture is that our culture has rejected divine authority in so many ways, not just in terms of the faith, but in terms of morality too. 
And once you reject divine authority, there is a natural craving in the human heart for someone to guide us. Once you reject divine authority, you are going to put yourself in a position where you are looking to other people for authority, or instead, engaging in what I call canonizing your own conscience, where your conscience becomes your authority. So that's the overall outline. And um, let me take you through some of these passages. I have on, um, let me just see if it's up there on the PowerPoint. Um, in the first slide, what I'd like to show you is um, the, uh, the relevant passage that has been lifted out of context from, from St. Thomas's commentary on the Gospel of John. Okay. Translated into English, it reads, it should be noted that though many might write concerning Catholic truth, there is this difference that those who wrote the canonical scripture, the evangelists and apostles and the like, so constantly asserted that they leave no room for doubt. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped down. Let me read from the top. Now John states that his gospel is true, and he speaks in the person of the entire church which receives it. My mouth will... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Hold on, I've got it here. <laughs> My mouth will utter truth. <laughs> I was thinking, filter? That doesn't look right. We should note that although many have written about Catholic truth, there is a difference among them. Those who wrote the canonical scriptures, such as the evangelists and apostles and the like, so constantly and firmly affirm this truth that it cannot be doubted. Thus John says, we know that his testimony is true. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, let him be accursed. The reason for this is that only the canonical scriptures are the standard of faith. The others have set forth this truth, but in such a way that they do not want to be believed except in those things which, in which they say what is true. Okay. That's the passage that is uh, giving people trouble. Okay. And the relevant line, which I highlighted on the next PowerPoint slide, is the following. The reason for this is that only the canonical scriptures are the standard of faith. In Latin, it reads, quis ratio es, quia sola canonica scriptura es regula fidei. Okay. Okay. Now, here's the problem with this context. When you look at the whole entire paragraph, you can see that clearly it lit, lifts the quote out of context. If you look at the immediate contrast, what, Aquin what Aquinas is trying to do here is he is trying to contrast the non-canonical writings with canonical scriptural writings. In other words, if I were to write anything about the life of Christ, you can be the judge as to whether or not it would be valuable, right? If what I write is in conformity with the teachings of the church, then it's going to be valuable. If I start writing things speculating as to what the, uh, the Holy Family's favorite dinner was, that's not anything that's in line with what the church teaches, and it really would have very little merit. That's the kind of contrast St. Thomas is trying to draw between canonical and non-canonical scriptures. And in the context of the whole passage, St. Thomas makes the point, and we'll, I'll go over this um, a little bit later, that John has a unique authority, first because of his special relationship with Jesus, but also his office as an apostle, and in particular, the most beloved apostle. Okay? We can see, this becomes a little bit clearer if we look at additional passages. Okay? Um, if you can, and this is available online, by the way. Um, I have the site there. Anyone who would like the site, I'd be happy to provide it to you by, um, uh, after, my, after my talk. Um, moving on to the, next, to the next slide, we can see in other passages how St. Thomas views tradition. Okay? This is a question as to whether or not the sacraments are instituted by God alone. Okay? And in the objection, which is a classic objection, the... Um, St. Thomas has to deal with the question of whether or not the sacraments are instituted by God. Why? Because so many, so many aspects to the sacramental rites are never mentioned in Holy Scripture. 
Isn't this the objection we always hear? St. Thomas's reply, which I have on the next PowerPoint slide, is simply this, and this is, this, in this one, he cuts to the heart of the matter. Human institutions observed in the sacraments are not essential to the sacrament, but belong to the solemnity, which is added to the sacraments in order to arouse devotion and reverence in the recipients. But those things that are essential to the sacrament are instituted by Christ himself, who is God and man. And though they are not all handed down by the scriptures, yet the church holds them from the intimate tradition of the apostles. According to the saying of the apostle in 1 Corinthians, the rest I will set in order when I come. It's hard to see how you could be any clearer in terms of your understanding of the importance of tradition and the, a clear indication that tradition is something that is instituted by Christ. Okay. Moving on to the next site. On, um, and again, these are all from the, when I have ST, that's the Summa Theologio, so this would be in the Terzi of Pars. All of this is available online. If you go to newadvent.org, they have the entire Summa available online. So if you know the section you want to look at, for example, you can go to the Terzi of Pars, 25th question, Article 3, you'll pull up exactly what I have up here. Okay, so it's all available. So in the Terzi of Pars, um, of the Summa Theologiae, St. Thomas considers this question whether or not um, it's, it is appropriate to worship images. Okay? And the argument again is scripture does not lay down anything concerning the adoration of images. Okay? On the next slide, I have St. Thomas's reply. The apostles, led by the inward instinct of the Holy Ghost, handed down to the churches certain instructions which they did not put in writing, but which have been ordained in accordance with the observance of the church as practiced by the faithful as time went on. Wherefore, the apostle says in 2 Thessalonians, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have learned, whether by word, that is by word of mouth, or by our epistle, that is, by word put into writing. And among these traditions is the worship of Christ's image. Wherefore, it is said that blessed Luke painted the image of Christ, which is in Rome. Again, a very, very clear statement of the importance of tradition. In the next slide, I promise, this will be short. I, I'll only go through some of these, but I'm an academic, and one of the things you realize when you're constructing an argument, you have to set out your text to prove it. Right? So bear with me on this, okay? <laughs> All right. On the next slide then, St. Thomas is considering whether a man who disbelieves one article of faith can have lifeless faith in the other articles. Okay? And in his response, this is a long response, so I lifted out the, the pertinent part. Now the formal object of faith is the first truth as manifested in Holy Writ and the teaching of the church, which proceeds from the first truth. Consequently, whoever does not adhere as to an infallible and divine rule to the teaching of the church, which proceeds from the first tr truth manifested in Holy Writ, has not the habit of faith, but holds that which is of faith otherwise than by faith. Even so, oh wait, no, I'll, I'll leave that part out. And again, this is a clear statement. In this one, we're, we're taking a slightly different tactic. And what we're saying, what St. Thomas is arguing, is for arguing for unity with the church. And here's the rest of it. Even so, it is evident that a man whose mind holds a conclusion without knowing how it is proved has not scientific knowledge, but merely an opinion about it. Now it is manifest that he who adheres to the teaching of the church, as to an infallible rule, assents to whatever the church teaches. Otherwise, if of the things taught by the church he holds what he chooses to hold and rejects what he chooses to reject, he no longer adheres to the teaching of the church as to an infallible rule, but to his own will. What is he saying there? Well, what he's arguing there or, or stating, I think very, you know, well, not, not necessarily very plainly, what he's stating is that your faith needs to be in conformity with the teaching of the church. And if you're the kind of person who's picking and choosing what you believe and what you don't believe, you can't be someone who claims to have faith. 
You have what he refers to as a lifeless faith. Why? Because you're no longer governed by loyalty or commitment to the truth as handed down by the church. What you're governed by instead is by your own will. You've become your own authority. And isn't that what we see so many times today? The final, final thing I'd like to look at um, with these, I just want to return to this passage on John, okay? Because I, what I gave you before was the short controversial statement. And if you remember, I noted that it was lifted out of context. Well, here's the context for the rest of it, okay? And in the rest of this passage, and again, this is available online, which is a tremendous resource. These, for years, these passages, these um, works of St. Thomas were only available if you went to a library. I remember when I, had, when I um, worked on my dissertation, I, um, I had to go, I was living in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania at the time, and I had to go to St. Charles Borromeo in order to find the text, because at that point, at that time, and this shows you how old I am, at that time, <laughs> things were not readily available online. In fact, kind of a funny story, a total digression. I always tell people, what I remember that trip for was not the, um, the library was wonderful, the seminary was beautiful, um, but what I remember that trip for was this. I had just had my fourth child, and I was under pressure to finish my, uh, my PhD, right? So my husband said to me, and my husband is wonderful, my husband said to me, he said, just go, I can handle it. So I left, right? But my, my, my youngest was only two months old, and of course, I was going through all this anxiety and guilt and everything. I spent the whole day in the library, I got everything done that I needed to get done. I came home and found the laundry done. The kitchen was spotless. There was a pot of soup bubbling on the stove. There were homemade cinnamon rolls in the oven. <laughs> I looked at my husband and said, what did you do? <laughs> it was devastating. How did you do this? I can't even get the laundry done. <laughs> well, later on, the kids let it slip that they watched a lot of TV, but that's a different story. <laughs> So that's what I remember that trip for. <laughs> anyway, so all of these are available online. Now it would be so much easier. I wouldn't have to uh, drag my husband away from work for a whole entire day um, while I trek to a library. Um, we, are, we are so, so fortunate with this. And the translations that are available online are really, really good. They're, they're excellent. They're um, done by um, very esteemed, very eminent Thomas, so I, I have a lot of confidence in using them. Okay, that was a total digression. Back to the commentary on the Gospel of John. St. Thomas, as he's going through, breaks it down a couple of, in a couple of things. And what I found interesting was that he immediately, the immediate question that came to St. that St. Thomas considered was, what is the authority of John? How does he have authority? Okay, he gives us a couple of reasons. First of all, he is the beloved disciple. He's mentioned in scripture as the one who was closest to, closest to Jesus. Understanding what was mentioned before, who was loved above the others, intimate with Christ, able to question him with confidence, and to whom it was granted to remain until Christ came. All of these things refer to the authority of the author. Okay? <clears throat> Okay, so that's his first point. So John is said to have been loved more than others. So first of all, he has this special relationship. St. Thomas also points out that John was noted for his exceptional charity, right? So he has a personal relationship with God. He's very, very holy. But that's, that doesn't settle it for St. Thomas. There's one more point that makes John a preeminent apostle or a preeminent authority in this, and that's on the next slide, which is that John, John's office is mentioned, which is to give testimony, and it is the special office of the apostles. So John's authority, first of all, yes, he was beloved. Yes, he was exceptionally holy, but John was one of the apostles, and so he stands firmly in this line of apostolic succession. So we can see that the, all of these reasons make John a privileged authority, okay? All right, 
Now, now I move away from the PowerPoint, so I promise I'm done with that. I hope I didn't bore you too much. Okay. If you look at St. Thomas, and again, this was one of those things when I, when I first proposed this topic, I, I was thinking really actually in terms of the things I'm going to discuss next. If you look at St. Thomas, one of the things you'll notice is he always, always uses other people as authorities. And as you study St. Thomas, you become familiar with a pattern of, or a hierarchy of authority he uses, okay? First and foremost, the, his go-to authority, the one that can't get any better would be divine revelation. Okay? And by divine revelation, as we've seen from these passages, we don't mean only scripture. That it can be anything that is transmitted directly, directly from, from God himself. Okay? Next, in terms of authorities, St. Thomas turns to the fathers of the church. And he gives incredible deference and respect to them. That would include Augustine, um, Basil, um, John Chrysostom, any of the early church fathers. He uses them to elucidate and to explain revelation. And finally, and isn't this interesting because everybody thinks of St. Thomas as the, the quintessential Aristotelian, but Aristotle and secular philosophers are absolutely the low man on the totem pole of authority for St. Thomas. Why? Because they're the farthest away from the truth. Which brings us to St. Thomas's vision of truth. How does he understand it? Well, for St. Thomas, the world is properly understood by beginning with God and looking at everything else in relationship to him. So we start with, if you look at how the Summa is oriented, you start with a discussion of who God is, and then we move to our discussion of man. We do it differently in our culture. In our culture, everything starts with us, right? We are completely steeped in a subjective approach. If you want to reach somebody with an argument, if you want to bring someone around to your point of view, if you're concerned about their behavior or you're concerned about where they are, where do you start? You don't start with a cosmological discussion of God and his creation. You start with a person, right? That's where our culture is. We have become extremely, extremely subjective. So instead of beginning with God and moving through to creation as St. Thomas would, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to take our culture's approach and look first at the person, okay? What do we know about the person? Well, if you look at what St. Thomas says about the person in the Summa, First and foremost, you find that our motivation, our chief motivation is the good. We want to be happy. St. Thomas describes it as wanting the universal good. In his treatise on happiness in the Summa Theologiae, he describes, he describes all of the things that don't make us happy. What does not make us happy? Money, power, prestige, Material goods, all of those things are nice, don't get me wrong, but they do not bring you final and complete happiness. And final and complete happiness for St. Thomas is defined as that state where all of your desires are satisfied. You have nothing else to wish for, nothing else to long for. Only one thing brings us that, and that is God. And St. Thomas, in this treatise on happiness, describes God as, quote, the universal good. What does that mean? Well, that's a pretty powerful statement. What that means is that means God is not just a good person, as we would understand things. Oh, so-and-so is a good person. Yeah, they're really good, you know. This spaghetti is really good. That's not what we're talking about. When we talk about God as the universal good, we mean he is the source and summit of all goodness. He contains in himself every perfection. St. Thomas has a theory, uh, a metaphysical theory known as the transcendentals. What that means is that means if you look at anything that exists, you can isolate five properties. Everything that exists has being, has unity, it exists as a single thing, has goodness, has beauty, and has truth. 
So when we say that God is the universal good, we're making a powerful statement that God encompasses all of those things. If you craft an argument for the existence of God based on beauty, based on truth, whatever it is, based on unity, you're, cre you're, you're creating a metaphysical argument that uses that, that concept of the transcendentals, that there is this absolute unity. Okay, well, okay, so we all want the universal good. Well, okay, what next? Well, we act in such a way as to obtain the universal good. We do good things to obtain the good. We do good things to make ourselves happy, right? Okay, there are a lot of very good secular persons out in the world. We all know them. Right? I can think of a lot of my neighbors who haven't gone to church in a long time, and they're really good people. They do a lot of good things, right? Is that what we're talking about? Well, that's not sufficient. And again, we get back to that doctrine of the transcendentals, which is that if you want to immerse, well, let me put it this way. The deeper you immerse yourself in searching for the good, the more you long for the truth. Why? Because of that relationship between truth and goodness. And so we can see that our desire to know God cannot simply be a desire to be a nice person and go around and do good things. For St. Thomas, it essentially consists in searching for the truth, knowing the truth. Okay? How do we know the truth? Well, our ability to know the truth is commensurate with our nature, right? So we can know things using natural reason. I can, using natural reason, I can, oh my gosh, I'm, 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 I actually shouldn't use myself as an example of this because I'm really bad at science. I spent the first year of my, my first year of college, I had a chemistry class and my chemistry partner was a nursing major. And I must have driven her crazy because in every single experiment, we had those long mercury thermometers Every single experiment, I broke the thermometer into the experiment. Don't ask me how. <laughs> and so our results were nullified. She ended up switching partners at the, uh, the midway through the semester. <laughs> she was really nice. I didn't blame her. I felt so sorry for her. So I, maybe I'm not the best example of this. <laughs> for St. Thomas, we are able to know the truth in a natural way using our reason, right? And there are a lot of things we could figure out about especially about moral acting that we could figure out on our own, right? It's common sense. If you want to live in a good community, don't steal from your neighbors, right? Okay? If you want to live in a community, we, well, nobody wants to live in a community where people are murdering each other. I think even the most confirmed secular humanist would be uncomfortable with that. So all of these things we can know through reason. But there is a lot that we can know through reason that is also contained in Revelation. So the question is, is God being redundant? No, St. Thomas says. He makes the point that even if, even if something is accessible to reason, you might not have the time to figure this out on your own. You might not have the resources. You might not have the education. You might not have the inclination. And when all is said and done, you might be mistaken. Right? Let's take an issue like stem, embryonic stem cell research. Right? There are a lot of people who are just busy. They're, they're struggling to, um, to earn a living for their families. They, it's not even on their radar. Right? There are some people who when they hear words like embryonic stem cell research, their eyes glaze over. It sounds like science. No inclination. There are some people for whom the, they've never had the opportunity to educate themselves on that issue. Okay? They're not going to know this. There are some people for whom, who are just too busy to just, you know, they'd like to know about it, they don't have the time. And then finally, even if you're someone who's studying it, you could still be mistaken. Okay? St. Thomas lists all of these as reasons why we need revelation in addition to reason. Now we can take those same arguments and apply them for why we need more than scripture alone. And this is why, again, when I was looking at this topic, I thought, oh, it's so obvious to me, having studied St. Thomas for so many years. Why do we need 
the tradition of the teach and the magister uh, the tradition of the church and the magisterial teaching in addition to scripture well let's go through the same reasons not everyone has the time to read all of scripture not everyone has the education not everyone has the inclination not everyone has the ability to sort of put it all together and even if you were one of those people who had all of those things going for you you could still be mistaken in your interpretation of scripture for those reasons it's very i think very clear in saint thomas that scripture alone is not what you rely on, but you look to the wisdom of so many people who have gone before you. Right? There's another piece of this puzzle, though, and that is this, that belief, and, and this is, actually I'm switching gears and going to a more recent Thomas, belief is something that involves belief in a person. Belief is something relational. And this comes from the writings of Pope John Paul II. Pope John Paul II describes the human being as one who lives by belief. He makes the point that when you believe someone, you are believing the truth of that other person. And so belief is fundamentally a relational act. It is an act of the will whereby you put yourself in a certain relationship with someone else. You intellectually assent to a proposition that's not known to you, and you entrust yourself to the authority of the person whose word you believe. Now, let me just say as an aside, belief does not always... Now, let me rephrase this. Divine revelation, I just made the point that divine revelation entails belief in a person. And what I'd like to do is just really quickly in one sentence contrast it with the kind of belief you have as a result of reason. You could, I, when I was teaching in the seminary years ago, I'll never forget the first new teacher. First time I taught the five proofs for the existence of God, I had all these excited seminarians. And one of them said, oh, this is great. I can't wait to use these, right? So this was right before fall break. And he went home and he had a relative who was a fallen away, not, not just a fallen away Catholic, but just didn't even believe in God, right? He came back completely crushed. <laughs> he said, I used everything. I went through every single proof for the existence of God, and she still didn't accept it. And I said, well, yeah, because belief is much more than simple reasoned arguments. It entails belief in a person. It entails so much more. We see this in the writings of Blaise Pascal, the philosopher, who contrasted the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with the God of the philosophers. We've seen this more recently in the writings of a famous British atheist rationalist philosopher, Sir Anthony Flew. He was the standard bearer for atheism for years. And in 2004, he wrote a short piece announcing that he now believed in God. However, he clarified. He said, I believe in God, but not the Christian God. I believe in God because of the work of my reason, but I'm just not there yet in terms of believing in the Christian God. Drawing that bright distinction between what we can know from, through reason and the fact that when we believe revelation, we are entrusting ourselves to the person of Christ. Now, there's a huge obstacle to this. All of us have what we could describe as the temptation to intellectual self-sufficiency. And you first see this in Genesis with the sin of Adam and Eve. What is this? This is the desire to decide things for yourself, to decide for yourself what's right and what's wrong. We see this also in the life of St. Augustine who describes in his conversion experience a period of time where he just couldn't make that step, make that, that leap of faith and commit himself wholeheartedly to Christianity. Why? Because he thought about it and he said, I can figure this out on my own. He's a smart guy. He's a lot smarter than I am. He really, really was tempted to just be on his own. And while this is an age-old temptation, this is a phenomenon that has grown worse in modern times. 
The reason why it's grown worse in modern times is because in modern philosophy since the Enlightenment, there has been a tendency to begin with your own ideas as the starting point for any kind of rigorous or critical analysis of the world. Descartes, with his famous cogito thought experiment, ushered in an era where each of us, trapped in our own ideas, have to think through for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. I always, when I'm teaching my students Descartes, I always make the point to them that um, as sincere as Descartes was, he was a very devout Christian, as sincere as he was in wanting to provide a rational basis for philosophy, he destroyed our ability to have moral conversation with each other. Why? Because if I'm my own authority and you're your own authority, we have no basis for settling our disagreements. If I'm really convinced that what I think is right and you're really convinced that what you think is right, they're equally right according to that perspective. Now, how did this come about? Well, for Aquinas, authority is the result of a certain relationship with the truth. God's word has authority, not because God said so, but because it is true. Follow me on this. This is, I, whenever I would do this to my students, they'd look at me like, what? What are you talking about? God's word is truth because he is truth. This is a kind of a difficult distinction. There was a philosopher, William of Ockham, in the 14th century who was known for his extreme voluntarism. And one of the things William of Ockham taught was that God's word has the truth because he says so. Well, it's hard to disagree with God's word being true, right? But if you take that perspective, then what you're saying is you're saying that God can deem anything to be true, and it will be true. Could God make a square circle? William of Ockham would have to conclude yes. St. Thomas would say no. Why? Because God's word is truth, and there's no truth in the concept of a square circle. It's a logical contradiction. So for St. Thomas, there is a seamless unity between God, truth, and reality that guarantees our success in seeking the truth. We don't have to worry about God being capricious in what he says. It's all part of the seamless, logical, eminently knowable truth. So, what does that have to do with authority? Well, from the Thomistic perspective, authority is never arbitrary, but carries with it a or stems from a relationship with the truth. From the second perspective, the perspective of someone like William of Ockham, authority is very much dependent on the person giving the command. And it is an expression of will rather than an expression of the truth. Since the time of William of Ockham, our culture has understood authority fundamentally as an expression of will. And that is why so many people have a problem with the authority. Since the time of the Enlightenment, the endeavor to understand the world has become a solitary activity where the only authority becomes your own crystal clear impressions. This leads to a toxic combination of ideas. Where anyone else's assertion of authority, especially in moral matters, is an imposition of their will on mine. And that, of course, especially to us Americans, is outrageous. And it lacks validity unless it originates concurrently from my own mind. So, so many people accept divine authority in scripture, right? They will accept that as an act of the will, but they insist on being the final judge of the interpretation of that scripture. They won't relinquish that kind of authority. So many people not only reject tradition and the teachings of the church, but reject any kind of moral teaching of the church. And for so many people, for so many people, the conscience 
become something that is completely self-referential, where your final authority in moral matters is your own conscience. And the conscience has now become canonized. We have in our culture so many people who are hostile to the canonization that occurs in the Catholic faith. Well, in our culture, we have different kinds of canonizations. We have what I would call the canonization of experts, those who are um, regular columnists in the New York Times or who are otherwise accessible through the media. And we have, on the other hand, the canonization of your own conscience, where your conscience becomes supreme in telling you what is right or wrong, but it is completely completely self-referential. Well, this puts us in a difficult position. If everyone is the Pope, how do we know what's true? And if all interpretations are equally valid, how do we know which is the right one? From the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas, we can see, for him, there's no question. There is a truth. That truth is found in the unity of the teachings of the church. And that unity stretches back all the way to Jesus himself. That's crystal clear. He writes with confidence. He writes with certainty. He writes, writes with great, great joy and great gratitude. And that really, I guess, is my final message to you, which is this, that when we look at the teachings of the church, we should be so incredibly, incredibly grateful. In embracing the teachings of the church, we are entrusting ourselves to the person of Christ. And when we stand with the church, whether we're standing with them, with the teachings of tradition, with the teachings of the magisterium, when we're standing with them with the interpretation of sacred scripture, with the sacraments, when we stand with the church, we stand with Christ. And finally, I would just like to say, and this is sort of a, um, a more um, personal note, um, in my position on that, the uh, Committee on Marriage Family, Marriage Lady, Family Life and Youth, I always get the initials wrong, um, one of the things that we've been discussing recently is the um, Defense of Marriage Act. And um, they prepared a summary for us on defense of marriage and all of the legislative developments. And it is dismaying. It is very dismaying. And in my work on different life issues, it's been very dismaying to see how far our culture has come. But I have to tell you, I have a profound sense of gratitude to the church for being the voice that stands for the truth and ultimately being the voice that stands for the person. And I guess the task that's imperative on all of us is to stand with them. Thank you very much. Thank you.